The Screaming Skull, Part One. I have often heard it scream. No, I am not nervous. I am not imaginative, and I never believed in ghosts, unless that thing is one. Whatever it is, it hates me almost as much as it hated Luke Pratt, and it screams at me. If I were you, I would never tell ugly stories about ingenious ways of killing people, for you never can tell but that someone at the table may be tired of his or her nearest and dearest. I have always blamed myself for Mrs. Pratt's death, and I suppose I was responsible for it, in a way, though heaven knows I never wished her anything but long life and happiness. If I had not told that story, she might be alive yet. That is why the thing screams at me, I fancy. She was a good little woman, with a sweet temper, all things considered, and a nice gentle voice. But I remember hearing her shriek once when she thought her little boy was killed by a pistol that went off, though everyone was sure it was not loaded. It was the same scream, exactly the same, with a sort of rising quaver at the end. Do you know what I mean? Unmistakable. The truth is, I had not realised that the doctor and his wife were not on good terms. They used to bicker a bit now and then when I was here, and I often noticed that little Mrs. Pratt got very red and bit her lip hard to keep her temper, while Luke grew pale and said the most offensive things. He was that sort when he was in the nursery, I remember, and afterwards at school. He was my cousin, you know. That is how I came by this house. After he died, and his boy Charlie was killed in South Africa, there were no relations left. Yes, it's a pretty little property. Just the sort of thing for an old sailor like me who is taken to gardening. One always remembers one's mistakes much more vividly than one's cleverest things, doesn't one? I've often noticed it. I was dining with the Pratts one night when I told them the story that afterwards made so much difference. It was a wet night in November, and the sea was moaning. Hush! If you don't speak, you will hear it now. Do you hear the tide? Gloomy sound, isn't it? Sometimes, about this time of year, Hello! There it is. Don't be frightened, man. It won't eat you. It's only a noise, after all. But I'm glad you've heard it, because there are always people who think it's the wind, or my imagination, or something. You won't hear it again tonight, I fancy, for it doesn't often come more than once. Yes, that's right. Put another stick on the fire, a little more stuff into that weak mixture you're so fond of. Do you remember old Blauklot, the carpenter, on that German ship that picked us up when the Klontaf went to the bottom? We were hove to in a howling gale one night, as snug as you please, with no land within five hundred miles, and a ship coming up and falling off as regularly as clockwork. Biddy de Boer Beebles ashore this night, boys. Old Blauklot sang out as he went off to his quarters with the sailmaker. I often think of that, now that I'm ashore for good and all. Yes, it was on a night like this, when I was at home for a spell, waiting to take the Olympia out on her first trip. It was on the next voyage that she broke the record, you remember. But that dates it. Ninety-two was the year, early in November. The weather was dirty. Pratt was out of temper, and the dinner was bad, very bad indeed, which didn't improve matters, and cold, which made it worse. The poor little lady was very unhappy about it, and insisted on making a Welsh rabbit on the table to counteract the raw turnips and the half-boiled mutton. Pratt must have had a hard day. Perhaps he had lost a patient. At all events, he was in a nasty temper. My wife is trying to poison me, you see, he said. She'll succeed some day. I saw that she was hurt, and I made believe to laugh, and said that Mrs. Pratt was much too clever to get rid of her husband in such a simple way. And then I began to tell them about Japanese tricks with spun glass and chopped horsehair and the like. Pratt was a doctor, and knew a lot more than I did about such things, but that only put me on my mettle and I told a story about a woman in Ireland who did for three husbands before anyone suspected foul play. 
Did you never hear that tale? The fourth husband managed to keep awake and caught her, and she was hanged. How did she do it? She drugged them, and poured melted lead into their ears through a little horned funnel when they were asleep. No, that's the wind whistling. It's backing up to the southward again. I can tell by the sound. Besides, the other thing doesn't often come more than once in an evening, even at this time of year, when it happened. Yes, it was in November. Poor Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in her bed, not long after I dined here. I can fix the date, because I got the news in New York by the steamer that followed the Olympia when I took her out on her first trip. You had the Leo Frick the same year? Yes, I remember. What a pair of old buffers we are coming to be, you and I. Nearly fifty years since we were apprenticed together on the Clontarf. Shall you ever forget old Blauklot? Many de poor people's assured boys. Ha, ha, ha! Take a little more with all that water. It's the old Hulth's cup I found in the cellar when his house came to me, the same I brought Luke from Amsterdam five and twenty years ago. He had never touched a drop of it. Perhaps he's sorry now, poor fellow. Where did I leave off? I told you that Mrs. Pratt died suddenly, yes. Luke must have been lonely here after she was dead, I should think. I came to see him now and then, and he looked worn and nervous, and told me that his practice was growing too heavy for him, though he wouldn't take an assistant on any account. Years went on, and his son was killed in South Africa, and after that he began to be queer. There was something about him not like other people. I believe he kept his senses in his profession to the end. There was no complaint about his having made mad mistakes in cases, or anything of that sort, but he had a look about him. Luke was a red-headed man with a pale face when he was young, and he was never stout. In middle age he turned a sandy grey, and after his son died he grew thinner and thinner, till his head looked like a skull with parchment stretched over it very tight and his eyes had a sort of glare in them that was very disagreeable to look at. He had an old dog that poor Mrs. Pratt had been fond of, and that used to follow her everywhere. He was a bulldog, and the sweetest-tempered beast you ever saw, though he had a way of hitching his upper lip behind one of his fangs that frightened strangers a good deal. Sometimes, of an evening, Pratt and Bumble, that was the dog's name, used to sit and look at each other a long time, thinking about old times, I suppose, when Luke's wife used to sit in that chair you've got. That was always her place, and this was the doctor's, where I am sitting. Bumble used to climb up by the footstool. He was old and fat by that time, and could not jump much, and his teeth were getting shaky. He would look steadily at Luke, and Luke looked steadily at the dog, his face growing more and more like a skull, with two little coals for eyes. And after about five minutes or so, though it may have been less, old Bumble would suddenly begin to shake all over, and all of a sudden he would set up an awful howl, as if he had been shot, and tumble out of the easy chair and trot away, and hide himself under the sideboard, and lie there making odd noises. Considering Pratt's looks in those last months, the thing is not surprising, you know. I'm not nervous or imaginative, but I can quite believe he might have sent a sensitive woman into hysterics. His head looked so much like a skull in parchment. At last, I came down one day before Christmas, when my ship was in dock and I had three weeks off. Bumble was not about, and I said casually that I supposed the old dog was dead. Yes. Pratt answered, and I thought there was something odd in his tone, even before he went on after a little pause. I killed him, he said presently. I could stand it no longer. I asked what it was that Luke could not stand, though I guessed well enough. He had a way of sitting in her chair and glaring at me, and then howling. Luke shivered a little. He didn't suffer at all, poor old Bumble. He went on in a hurry, as if he thought I might imagine he had been cruel. I put dinine into his drink to make him sleep soundly, 
and then I chloroformed him gradually, so that he could not have felt suffocated even if he was dreaming. It's been quiet since then. I wondered what he meant, for the words slipped out as if he could not help saying them. I've understood since. He meant that he did not hear that noise so often after the dog was out of the way. Perhaps he thought at first that it was old Bumble in the yard howling at the moon, though it's not that kind of noise, is it? Besides, I know what it is, if Luke didn't. It's only a noise, after all, and a noise never hurt anybody yet. But he was much more imaginative than I am. No doubt there really is something about this place that I don't understand. But when I don't understand a thing, I call it a phenomenon and I don't take it for granted that it's going to kill me, as he did. I don't understand everything, by long odds, nor do you, nor does any man who has been to sea. We used to talk of tidal waves, for instance, and we could not account for them. Now we account for them by calling them submarine earthquakes, and we branch off into fifty theories, any one of which might make earthquakes quite comprehensible if we only knew what they were. I fell in with one of them once, and the inkstand flew straight up from the table against the ceiling of my cabin. The same thing happened to Captain Lecky. I dare say you've read about it in his Wrinkles. Very good. If that sort of thing took place ashore, in this room, for instance, a nervous person would talk about spirits and levitation and fifty things that mean nothing, instead of just quietly setting it down as a phenomenon that has not been explained yet. My view of that voice, you see. Besides, what is there to prove that Luke killed his wife? I would not even suggest such a thing to anyone but you. After all, there was nothing but the coincidence that poor little Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in her bed a few days after I told that story at dinner. She was not the only woman who ever died like that. Luke got the doctor over from the next parish and they agreed that she had died of something the matter with her heart. Why not? It's common enough. Of course, there was the ladle. I never told anyone about that, and it made me start when I found it in the cupboard in the bedroom. It was new, too, a little tinned iron ladle that had not been in the fire more than once or twice, and there was some lead in it that had been melted and stuck to the bottom of the bowl, all grey, with hardened dross on it. But that proves nothing. A country doctor is generally a handy man, who does everything for himself, and Luke may have had a dozen reasons for melting a little lead in a ladle. He was fond of sea-fishing, for instance, and he may have cast a sinker for a night-line. Perhaps it was a weight for the whole clock, or something like that. All the same, when I found it, I had a rather queer sensation because it looked so much like the thing I had described when I told them the story. Do you understand? It affected me unpleasantly, and I threw it away. It's at the bottom of the sea, a mile from the spit, and it will be jolly well rusted beyond recognising if it's ever washed up by the tide. You see, Luke must have bought it in the village, years ago, for the man just sells such ladles still. I suppose they are used in cooking, in any case, there was no reason why an inquisitive housemaid should find such a thing lying about with lead in it, and wonder what it was, and perhaps talk to the maid who heard me tell the story at dinner, for that girl married the plumber's son in the village, and may remember the whole thing. You understand me, don't you? Now that Luke Pratt is dead and gone, and lies buried beside his wife, with an honest man's tombstone at his head? I should not care to stir up anything that could hurt his memory. They are both dead, and their son, too. There was trouble enough about Luke's death as it was. How? He was found dead on the beach one morning, and there was a coroner's inquest. There were marks on his throat, but he had not been robbed. The verdict was that he had come to his end by the hands or teeth of some person or animal unknown for half the jury thought it might have been a big dog that had thrown him down and gripped his windpipe, though the skin of his throat was not broken. 
No one knew at what time he had gone out, nor where he had been. He was found lying on his back above high water mark, and an old cardboard bandbox that had belonged to his wife lay under his hand, open. The lid had fallen off. He seemed to have been carrying home a skull in the box. Doctors are fond of collecting such things. It had rolled out and lay near his head, and it was a remarkably fine skull, rather small, beautifully shaped, and very white, with perfect teeth. That is to say, the upper jaw was perfect, but there was no lower one at all, when I first saw it. Yes, I found it here when I came. You see, it was very white and polished, like a thing meant to be kept under a glass case, and the people did not know where it had come from, nor what to do with it, so they put it back into the bandbox and set it on the shelf of the cupboard in the best bedroom, and of course they showed it to me when I took possession. I was taken down to the beach, too, to be shown the place where Luke was found and the old fisherman explained just how he was lying and the skull beside him. The only point he could not explain was why the skull had rolled up the sloping stand towards Luke's head, instead of rolling downhill to his feet. It did not seem odd to me at the time, but I have often thought of it since, for the place is rather steep. I'll take you there tomorrow, if you like. I made a sort of cairn of stones there afterwards. When he fell down, or was thrown down, whichever happened, the bandbox struck the sand, and the lid came off, and the thing came out, and ought to have rolled down. But it didn't. It was close to his head, almost touching it, and turned with the face towards it. I say it didn't strike me as odd when the man told me, but I could not help thinking about it afterwards, again and again until I saw a picture of it all when I closed my eyes, and then I began to ask myself why the plaguey thing had rolled up instead of down, and why it had stopped near Luke's head instead of anywhere else, a yard away, for instance. You naturally want to know what conclusion I reached, don't you? None that at all explained the rolling, at all events, but I got something else into my head after a time, that made me feel downright uncomfortable. Oh, I don't mean as to anything supernatural. There may be ghosts, or there may not be. If there are, I'm not inclined to believe they can hurt living people except by frightening them. And, for my part, I'd rather face any shape of ghost than a fog in the channel when it's crowded. No. What bothered me was just a foolish idea. That's all. And I cannot tell how it began nor what made it grow till it turned into a certainty. I was thinking about Luke and his poor wife one evening over my pipe and a dull book, when it occurred to me that the skull might possibly be hers, and I have never got rid of the thought since. You'll tell me there's no sense in it? No doubt that Mrs. Pratt was buried like a Christian and is lying in the churchyard where they put her that it's perfectly monstrous to suppose her husband kept her skull in her old bandbox in his bedroom? All the same, in the face of reason and common sense and probability, I'm convinced that he did. Doctors do all sorts of queer things which would make men like you and me feel creepy, and those are just the things that don't seem probable or logical or sensible to us. Then, don't you see, if it really was her skull, poor woman, the only way of accounting for his having it is that he really killed her, and did it in that way, as the woman killed her husband's in the story, and that he was afraid there might be an examination some day which would betray him. You see, I told that too, and I believe it had really happened some fifty or sixty years ago. They dug up the three skulls, you know, and there was a small lump of lead rattling about in each one. That was what hanged the woman. Luke remembered that, I'm sure. I don't want to know what he did when he thought of it. My taste never ran in the direction of horrors. I don't fancy you care for them either, do you? No. If you did, you might supply what is wanting to the story. It must have been rather grim, eh? I wish I did not see the whole thing so distinctly just as everything must have happened. 
He took it the night before she was buried, I'm sure, after the coffin had been shut, and when the servant girl was asleep. I would bet anything that when he got it, he put something under the sheet in its place to fill up and look like it. What do you suppose he put there under the sheet? I don't wonder you take me up on what I'm saying. First I tell you that I don't want to know what happened, and that I hate to think about horrors, and then I describe the whole thing to you as if I had seen it. I'm quite sure that it was her work bag that he put there. I remember the bag very well, for he, she always used it of an evening. It was made of brown plush, and when it was stuffed full, it was about the size of, you understand. Yes, there I am, at it again. You may laugh at me, but you don't live here alone, where it was done, and you didn't tell Luke the story about the melted lead. I'm not nervous, I tell you, but sometimes I begin to feel that I understand why some people are. I dwell on all this when I'm alone, and I dream of it, and when that thing screams, well, frankly, I don't like the noise any more than you do, though I should be used to it by this time. I ought not to be nervous. I've sailed in a haunted ship. There was a man in the top, and two-thirds of the crew died of the West Coast fever inside of ten days after we anchored. But I was all right, then and afterwards. I've seen some ugly sights too, just as you have, and all the rest of us. But nothing ever stuck in my head in the way this does. You see, I've tried to get rid of the thing, but it doesn't like that. It wants to be there in its place, in Mrs. Pratt's bandbox in the cupboard in the best bedroom. It's not happy anywhere else. How do I know that? Because I've tried it. You don't suppose that I've not tried, do you? As long as it's there, it only screams now and then, generally at this time of year. But if I put it out of the house, it goes on all night, and no servant will stay here twenty-four hours. As it is, I have often been left alone, and have been obliged to shift to myself for a fortnight at a time. No one from the village would ever pass a night under the roof now, and as for selling the place, or even letting it, that's out of the question. The old women say that if I stay here, I shall come to a bad end myself before long. I am not afraid of that. You smile at the mere idea that any one could take such nonsense seriously. Quite right. It's utterly blatant nonsense. I agree with you. Didn't I tell you that it's only a noise after all, when you started and looked around, as if you expected to see a ghost standing behind your chair? I may be all wrong about the skull, and I like to think that I am when I can. It may be just a fine specimen which Luke got somewhere long ago, and what rattles about inside when you shake it may be nothing but a pebble or a bit of hard clay, or anything. Skulls that have lain long in the ground generally have something inside them that rattles, don't they? No, I've never tried to get it out, whatever it is. I'm afraid it might be lead, don't you see? As it is, I don't want to know the fact, for I'd much rather not be sure. If it really is lead, I'd killed her quite as much as if I had done the deed myself. Anybody must see that, I should think. As long as I don't know for certain, I have the consolation of saying that it's all utterly ridiculous nonsense, that Mrs. Pratt died a natural death, and that the beautiful skull belonged to Luke when he was a student in London. But if I were quite sure, I believe I should have to leave the house. Indeed I do, most certainly. As it is, I had to give up to trying to sleep in the best bedroom where the cupboard is. You ask me why I don't throw it into the pond. Yes, but please don't call it a confounded bugbear. It doesn't like being called names. There! Lord, what a shriek! I told you so. You're quite pale, man. Fill up your pipe and draw your chair nearer to the fire and take some more drink. Old Holland's never hurt anybody yet. I've seen a Dutchman in Java drink half a jug of Hoots Camp in a morning without turning a hair. I don't take much rum myself, because it doesn't agree with my rheumatism. But you are not rheumatic, and it won't damage you. Besides, 
It's a very damp night outside. The wind is howling again, and it will soon be in the southwest. Do you hear how the windows rattle? The tide must have turned too by the moaning. We should not have heard the thing again if you had not said that. I'm pretty sure we should not. Oh, yes. If you choose to describe it as a coincidence, you are quite welcome. But I would rather that you should not call the thing names again if you don't mind. It may be that the poor little woman hears, and perhaps it hurts her, don't you know? Ghosts? No. You don't call anything a ghost that you can take in your hands and look out in broad daylight, and that rattles when you shake it, do you now? But it's something that hears and understands. There's no doubt about that. I tried sleeping in the best bedroom when I first came to the house, just because it was the best and most comfortable. But I had to give it up. It was their room, and there's the big bed she died in and the cupboard is in the thickness of the wall, near the head, on the left. That's where it likes to be kept, in its bandbox. I only used the room for a fortnight after I came, and then I turned out and took the little room downstairs, next to the surgery, where Luke used to sleep when he expected to be called to a patient during the night. I was always a good sleeper ashore. Eight hours is my dose, eleven to seven when I'm alone, twelve to eight when I have a friend with me. But I could not sleep after three o'clock in the morning in that room, a quarter past, to be accurate. As a matter of fact, I timed it with my old pocket chronometer, which still keeps good time, and it was always at exactly seventeen minutes past three. I wonder whether that was the hour when she died. It was not what you have heard. If it had been that, I would not have stood it two nights. It was just a start and a moan and hard breathing for a few seconds in the cupboard, and it could never have waked me under ordinary circumstances, I'm sure. I suppose you are like me in that, and we are just like other people who have been to sea. No natural sounds disturb us at all. Not all the racket of a square rigger hove to in a heavy gale, or rolling on her beam ends before the wind. If a lead pencil gets adrift and rattles in the drawer of your cabin table, you are awake in a moment. Just so. You always understand. Very well. The noise in the cupboard was no louder than that, but it waked me instantly. I said it was like a start. I know what I mean, but it's hard to explain without seeming to talk nonsense. Of course, you cannot exactly hear a person start at the most. You might hear a quick drawing of the breath between the parted lips and closed teeth, and the almost imperceptible sound of clothing that moved suddenly, though very slightly. It was like that. You know how one feels what a sailing vessel is going to do two or three seconds before she does it, when one has the wheel. Riders say it's the same of a horse, but that's less strange because the horse is a live animal with feelings of its own, and only poets and landsmen talk about a ship being alive and all that. But I've always felt somehow that besides being a steaming machine or a sailing machine for carrying weights, a vessel at sea is a sensitive instrument and a means of communication between nature and man, and most particularly the man at the wheel, if she is steered by hand. She takes her impressions directly from wind and sea, tide and stream, and transmits them to the man's hand, just as the wireless telegraphy picks up the interrupted currents aloft and turns them out below in the form of a message. You see what I am driving at. I felt that something started in the cupboard, and I felt it so vividly that I heard it, though there may have been nothing to hear and the sound inside my head waked me suddenly. But I really heard the other noise. It was as if it were muffled inside a box, as far away as if it came through a long-distance telephone, and yet I knew that it was inside the cupboard near the head of my bed. My hair did not bristle, and my blood did not run cold that time. I simply resented being waked up by something that had no business to make a noise, any more than a pencil should rattle in the drawer of my cabin table on board ship. 
for I did not understand. I just supposed that the cupboard had some communication with the outside air, and that the wind had got in and was moaning through it with a sort of very faint screech. I struck a light and looked at my watch, and it was seventeen minutes past three. Then I turned over and went to sleep on my right ear. That's my good one. I'm pretty deaf with the other, for I struck the water with it when I was a lad in diving from the fore topsail yard. Silly thing to do, it was, but the result is very convenient when I want to go to sleep when there's a noise. That was the first night, and the same thing happened again, and several times afterwards, but not regularly, though it was always at the same time to a second. Perhaps I was some time sleeping on my good ear, and sometimes not. I overhauled the cupboard, and there was no way by which the wind could get in, or anything else, for the door makes a good fit, having been meant to keep out moths, I suppose. Mrs. Pratt must have kept her winter things in it, for it still smells of camphor and turpentine. After about a fortnight, I had had enough of the noises. So far I had said to myself that it would be silly to yield to it, and take the skull out of the room. Things always look differently by daylight, don't they? But the voice grew louder. I suppose one may call it a voice. And it got inside my deaf ear, too, one night. I realized that when I was wide awake, for my good ear was jammed down on the pillow, and I ought not to have heard a foghorn in that position. But I heard that, and it made me lose my temper, unless it scared me, for sometimes the two are not far apart. I struck a light and got up, and I opened the cupboard, grabbed the bandbox, and threw it out the window as far as I could. Then my hair stood on end. The thing screamed in the air, like a shell from a twelve-inch gun. It fell on the other side of the road. The night was very dark, and I could not see it fall, but I know it fell beyond the road. The window is just over the front door. It's fifteen yards to the fence, more or less, and the road is ten yards wide. There's a thick-set hedge beyond, along the glebe that belongs to the vicarage. I did not sleep much more that night. It was not much more than half an hour after I had thrown the bandbox out when I heard a shriek outside, like what we've had tonight, but worse, more despairing, I should call it. And it may be my imagination but I could have sworn that the screams came nearer and nearer each time. I lit a pipe and walked up and down for a bit, and then took a book and sat up reading. But I'll be hanged if I can remember what I read, nor even what the book was, for every now and then a shriek came up that would have made a dead man turn in his coffin. A little before dawn, someone knocked at the front door. There was no mistaking that for anything else, and I opened my window and looked down, for I guessed that someone wanted the doctor, supposing that the new man had taken Luke's house. It was rather a relief to hear a human knock after that awful noise. You cannot see the door from above, owing to the little porch. The knocking came again, and I called out, asking who was there, but nobody answered, though the knock was repeated. I sang out again, and said that the doctor did not live here any longer. There was no answer, but it occurred to me that it might be some old countryman who was stone deaf. So I took my candle and went down to open the door. Upon my word, I was not thinking of the thing yet, and I had almost forgotten the other noises. I went down convinced that I should find somebody outside, on the doorstep, with a message. I set the candle on the hall table, so that the wind should not blow it out when I opened. While I was drawing the old-fashioned bolt, I heard the knocking again. It was not loud, and it had a queer, hollow sound. Now that I was close to it, I remember, but I certainly thought it was made by some person who wanted to get in. It wasn't. There was nobody there, but as I opened the door inward, standing a little on one side, so as to see out at once, something rolled across the threshold and stopped against my foot. 
I drew back as I felt it, for I knew what it was before I looked down. I cannot tell you how I knew, and it seemed unreasonable, for I am still quite sure that I had thrown it across the road. It's a French window that opens wide, and I got a good swing when I flung it out. Besides, when I went out early in the morning, I found the bandbox beyond the thick hedge. You may think it opened when I threw it, and that the skull dropped out, but that's impossible for nobody could throw an empty cardboard box so far. It's out of the question. You might as well try to fling a ball of paper twenty-five yards, or a blown bird's egg. To go back, I shut and bolted the hall door, picked the thing up carefully, and put it on the table beside the candle. I did that mechanically, as one instinctively does the right thing in danger, without thinking at all, unless one does the opposite. It may seem odd, but I believe my first thought had been that someone might come and find me there on the threshold, while it was resting against my foot, lying a little on its side, and turning one hollow eye up at my face, as if it meant to accuse me, and the light and shadow from the candle played in the hollows of the eyes as it stood on the table, so that they seemed to open and shut at me. Then the candle went out quite unexpectedly, though the door was fastened, and there was not the least draught, and I used up at least half a dozen batches before it would burn again. I sat down rather suddenly, without quite knowing why. Probably I had been badly frightened, and perhaps you will admit there was no great shame in being scared. The thing had come home, and it wanted to go upstairs, back to its cupboard. I sat still, and stared at it for a bit, till I began to feel very cold. Then I took it, and carried it up, and set it in its place, and I remember that I spoke to it, and promised that it should have its bandbox again in the morning. You want to know whether I stayed in the room till daybreak? Yes, but I kept the light burning, and sat up smoking and reading, most likely out of fright plain, undeniable fear, and you need not call it cowardice either, for that's not the same thing. I could not have stayed alone with that thing in the cupboard. I should have been scared to death, though I'm not more timid than other people. Confound it, old man! It had crossed the road alone, and had got up the doorstep, and had knocked to be let in. When the dawn came, I put on my boots, and went out to find the bandbox. I had to go a good way round by the gate near the high road, and I found the box open and hanging on the other side of the hedge. It had caught on the twigs by the string, and the lid had fallen off and was lying on the ground below it. That shows that it did not open till it was well over, and if it had not opened as soon as it had left my hand, what was inside it must have gone beyond the road too. That's all. I took the box upstairs to the cupboard, and put the skull back, and locked it up. When the girl brought me my breakfast, she said she was sorry, but that she must go, and she did not care if she lost her month's wages. I looked at her, and her face was a sort of greenish-yellowish-white. I pretended to be surprised, and asked what was the matter, but that was of no use, for she just turned on me, and wanted to know whether I meant to stay in a haunted house, and how long I expected to live if I did. For though she noticed I was sometimes a little hard of hearing, she did not believe that even I could sleep through those screams again. And if I could, why had I been moving about the house and opening and shutting the front door between three and four in the morning? There was no answering that, since she had heard me. So off she went, and I was left to myself. I went down to the village during the morning and found a woman who was willing to come and do the little work there is and cook my dinner on condition that she might go home every night. As for me, I moved downstairs that day, and I have never tried to sleep in the best bedroom since. After a little while, I got a brace of middle-aged Scots servants from London, and things were quiet enough for a long time. I began by telling them that the house was in a very exposed position, and that the wind whistled round it a good deal in the autumn and winter, which had given it a bad name in the village, 
the Cornish people being inclined to superstition and telling ghost stories. The two hard-faced, sandy-haired sisters almost smiled, and they answered with great contempt that they had no great opinion of any southern bogey whatever, having been in service in two English haunted houses where they had never seen so much as the boy in grey whom they reckoned no very particular rarity in Forfarshire. They stayed with me several months, and while they were in the house we had peace and quiet. One of them is here again now, but she went away with her sister within the year. This one, she was the cook, married the sexton who works in my garden. That's the way of it. It's a small village, and he has not much to do, and he knows enough about flowers to help me nicely besides doing most of the hard work, for though I'm fond of exercise, I'm getting a little stiff in the hinges. He's a sober, silent sort of fellow, who minds his own business, and he was a widower when I came here. Trahairne is his name, James Trahairne. The Scottish sisters would not admit that there was anything wrong about the house, but when November came, they gave me warning that they were going, on the ground that the chapel was such a long walk from here being the next parish, and that they could not possibly go to our church. But the younger one came back in the spring, and as soon as the bans could be published, she was married to James Traherne by the vicar, and she seems to have had no scruples about hearing him preach since then. I am quite satisfied, if she is. The couple live in a small cottage that looks over the churchyard. I suppose you are wondering what all this has to do with what I am talking about. I'm alone so much that when an old friend comes to see me, I sometimes go on talking just for the sake of hearing my own voice. But in this case, there really is a connection of ideas. It was James Traherne who buried poor Mrs. Pratt and her husband after her in the same grave, and is not far from the back of his cottage. That's the connection in my mind, you see. It's plain enough. He knows something. I'm quite sure he does though he's such a reticent beggar. End of the Screaming Skull, Part 1, by F. Marion Crawford.